Right. Where's my... Good afternoon, everyone. The committee will come to order, and I note that a quorum is present. And before we uh, get into starting uh, with uh, our bills, I'd like to welcome our newest member, Miss Marcy Captor. From, yes, let's give her a hand. Ms. Captor is a dear and longtime friend of mine, and she has had a distinguished, long-running career as a member of Congress, and we just want to welcome you, Ms. Captor, and I know you will bring the kind of energy and leadership that you have brought to your other committee assignments, and you're noted for your great, tenacious work your diligence and your caring about agriculture. We've talked about it many a time, and now you're here. So I'd like to welcome you and allow you, if you would like, to say a few words. <laughs> Dean of Women, yes. Well, I don't know if I should say anything, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you so very much for that rousing introduction and to the members of the committee, Ranking Member Thompson and every member for welcoming me so graciously uh, to serve on the House Agriculture Committee. Um, your work and vision are critical to our nation. There's no question about that. And we know how this committee delivers uh, for the American people, for our farmers, ranchers, herders, and agricultural workers who make, build, and grow America. As a former ranking member of the House Agriculture Appropriations Committee, I am so grateful to join this committee to help America meet its agricultural horizons in this 21st century. My focus has long <laughs> been on protecting America's farmers against unfair global trade practices, mm -hmm. investing in rural development, promoting a broad range of innovations in biofuels, and advancing cutting-edge animal and agricultural research, including in the field of medicine. I especially look forward to partnering with you to support the WIC and Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Programs that strengthen local agreements by connecting families and seniors in need with coupons uh, to purchase produce at local farmers markets and fruit stands, and further, I am committed to transforming urban food deserts into places where healthy, affordable food is available to all. So with millions of acres of farmland and tens of thousands of family farms, Ohio's as well as Georgia's farmers in rural communities help feed and grow America. And I look forward to working <coughs> with all of you to ensure America's agricultural heartland receives the attention and investment it deserves. I'm just so grateful to be here and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Ranking Member. Thank you all. I yield back. And thank you, Ms. Captor, and uh, we all welcome you and look forward to working with you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here to consider the committee's budget views and estimates for fiscal year 2023 as required by the Congressional Budget Act and in compliance with House rules. Each member has been provided a copy of the material that's on the agenda for today. And I'm pleased that I was able to work very well with our distinguished ranking member in drafting this letter. And we worked to highlight the issues facing agriculture and especially rural America in our comments on the Budget Committee. And so now I'd like to yield to my friend, the ranking member, Mr. Thompson, for any remarks he would like to make. Well, Chairman, thank you so much. And I do appreciate uh, your cooperation and collaboration working together uh, in the drafting of this letter, uh, where we did work to highlight the issues that are facing agriculture and rural America in our comments to the uh, Budget Committee. Um, 
you know, there were a, uh, you know, there were a number of bills uh, and, well, and, and I appreciate your cooperation in negotiating, you know, today's markup yeah. overall. We, uh, um, a lot of good work that was done together, a number of bills that were dropped from today's meeting due to the need for just further revisions, vetting and, and technical assistance. And I, and I appreciate that decision. And while there are other pieces of legislation that were ready for markup but not included in today's proceedings, you know, we look forward to working with, uh, with you on, on those important priorities. You know, last July, the President issued an executive order promoting competition in the American economy under the guise industry consolidation was increasing prices for families and wreaking havoc on our supply chains, decreasing wages for workers, and stifling innovation and economic growth. And at the time, the majority jammed through and the President signed into law billions in new spending under the pretext of COVID relief uh, with the American Rescue Plan, and the White House has begun had begun soon to be failed attempts to pass trillions more under the President's alleged Build Back Better initiative, all the while the Biden administration continues to pursue the same regulatory assault on agriculture and industry it had mounted before admitting inflation was even a problem. And then 10 months later, the White House continues to argue consolidation is the blame for a fractured supply chain, historic inflation as the most mainstream uh, economists scratch their heads. Now, this, this information has seeped into Congress through hearings and legislation focused on issues such as cattle markets, energy, and most recently adult and infant formula. Uh, so, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I'd like unanimous consent to submit a recent Morgan Stanley report into the record. Uh, the, uh, the report directly... Go ahead. Without objection. Thanks, Thank sir. Uh, the report uh, states, and I quote, the slack created by the COVID recession is being absorbed faster than, than usual. While some of this is due to supply disruptions created by the lockdowns, we, we think it was more due to excessive fiscal stimulus provided during the pandemic, particularly the $1.9 trillion package at the end of March 2021. In our view, this was what turbocharged consumption and drove inflation to 40-year highs, end of quote. So we're here today to discuss the selection of bills that range in theme, scope, purpose, and impact. And while few are solid pieces of legislation and offer a dash of hope, others simply de demonize industries and kick the policy can down the road. So, Mr. Chairman, I think most of us would agree our, our, our farm families need immediate action to address skyrocketing input costs, uh, supply chain uncertainties, and other challenges. I, I think we can also agree these crisis cannot be mitigated with studies, task forces, third parties, or and big government. We, we need manufacturers, importers, industry, farmers, and other players at the table. We, we need this administration to stop its irresponsible regulatory action and the majority to stop fueling the fire with out-of-control spending packages and haphazard policy. And I, I look forward to today's discussion and to continue our work together to, to develop common sense solutions to the crisis our rural communities are facing. And with that, I, I yield back. And thank you, Ranking Member. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, the first order of business today is to adopt the committee's budget views and estimate letter that was prepared uh, in consultation with our Ranking Member, Mr. Thompson, and must be submitted to the Budget Committee pursuant to the Congressional Budget Act and House Rules. And now I recognize the ranking member for a motion. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Chairman, I, I move that the committee approve the letter regarding its views and estimates so it may be forwarded to the Budget Committee. This is a debatable motion, members. Are there any members uh, which would like to discuss the letter? Hearing none, no further discussion. The question is on the motion offered by the gentleman from Pennsylvania to approve the letter. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, signify by saying no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the letter is approved. Does any member wish to file any supplemental or minority or additional views on the letter that will be transmitted to the Budget Committee. Any members? 
So, with the approval of our budget views and estimates completed, we will now move to the consideration of the legislation on our agenda today. These bills address some of our supply chain issues, input costs for our farmers and ranchers, and ultimately, the resilience of our great American economy. And I look forward to our discussion today, as well as hearing directly from the sponsors of these bills. And I would also like to thank the wonderful team at the Department of Agriculture for their technical assistance, very valuable assistance that they have provided on several of our bills under consideration today. And now I yield to the ranking member, uh, Mr. Thompson, for any comments you'd like to make. All right, Chairman, thank you very much. I want to thank you for your, uh, your collaboration and the collaboration of both our staffs uh, working together yeah. on, this, uh, on these bills today. Um, especially I know as part of this, what we're looking at is, is perhaps with some in a unanimous consent package. And I'd like to address two bills in particular included in this package. H.R. 2518, Producing Responsible Energy and Conservation Incentives and Solutions for the Environment, or the PRECISE Act introduced by Representative Henson of Iowa, and my bill, H.R. 2606, the Sponsoring USDA Sustainability Targets in Agriculture to Incentivize Natural solu Solutions, or the SUSTAINS Act. In the PRECISE Act, I want to thank Representative Henson for her leadership on this important bill. Uh, through science and innovation, American farmers have become the most efficient producers of food and fiber in the world. Adopting new technologies and practices such as precision agriculture can be expensive, and farmers already borrow more money each year to produce a crop that most Americans will than what most Americans will borrow in a lifetime. This legislation provides increased assistance for precision agriculture through existing conservation programs, EQIP, CSP, and the Conservation Loan Program. Expanding precision ag agriculture technology will help producers reduce inputs and production costs while providing both environmental and climate benefits. Now, this is a common sense bill, and I thank the chairman for its inclusion in this package. The SUSTAINS Act, uh, USDA's conservation programs, provide producers and landowners with a variety of voluntary incentive-based tools to address natural resource priorities. Uh, this includes cost share opportunities for improving soil and water quality, wildlife habitat, and expanding the use of practices that sequester carbon. However, while the demand for these programs has remained strong, NRCS is only able to fund and provide technical assistance for a fraction of the applications. At the same time, many large corporations have made public commitments to lower their carbon footprint within their supply chain, but are struggling to find the best way to achieve those goals. And to help encourage more private sector investment into conservation and introduce the SUSTAINS Act, this legislation authorizes a new account at USDA that allows for the private sector to make donations, which would in turn be used to fund conservation programs, projects, through all the existing programs. In doing so, we can allow uh, companies and businesses, large and small, to partner with both USDA and producers for targeted conservation projects that would benefit agriculture and the environment. Creating this account and authorizing donations gives the private sector the opportunity to help meet their public climate change commitments and demonstrate their climate uh, credentials by investing in proven conservation programs administered by USDA. By passing this bill, we can dramatically expand voluntary conservation opportunities, which provide direct benefits to farmers, ranchers, and landowners. I, I strongly support this legislation, along with the broader package, and I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member. And the Chair would request that other members submit any other statements for the record. Without objection, the Chair may recess the committee, subject to the call of the Chair, at any point during this meeting. I would like to remind members that only amendments germane to the subject matter before us today shall be in order. No motion or proposition on a subject different than that under consideration shall be submitted under the color of amendment 
And members are reminded to unmute when you are recognized to speak and when you're not to please make sure you are muted and to appear on the screen when they are called on to vote if they are participating virtually today. Amendment submitted in advance for any member, any matter under consideration today were emailed to members' offices last night and earlier today. Members will be responsible for having before them the text of any amendment. Short of that, please let us know if you need assistance. Pursuant to Committee Rule 3I and House Rule 11, Clause 2, the Chair may postpone further proceedings today on the question of approving any measure or matter uh, of, uh, of approving <clears throat> any measure or matter or adopting in any amendment on which a recorded vote is ordered. We have uh, majority and minority committee councils with us if any member has any legal questions relating to the legislation that we are considering today, please let us know so that we can get you any legal interpretation you may need. Also, with the cooperation of our ranking member Thompson and other members on our committee, it appears that we have worked out an agreement on five bills scheduled for markup today. And these are House uh, Resolution 7764, a bill to direct the Secretary of Agriculture to provide additional payments under the Environmental Quality Incentives Program for implementation of a nutrient management practice and for other purposes. And then we have H.R. 2518, producing responsible energy and conservation incentives and solutions for the Environment Act or called the Precise Act. And then we have H.R. 2606, sponsoring USDA sustainability targets in agriculture to incentivize Natural Solutions Act of 2021, or we call the Sustains Act. And then we have H.R. 4140, the Butcher Block Act. And then we have H.R. 7675, to amend the Department of Agriculture's Reorganization Act of 1994 to establish an agricultural and food system supply chain resilience and crisis response task force and for other purpose. Before we begin, is there any member that might seek time to speak on any of these bills in this unanimous consent package. Mr. Yes, Chairman. Mr. Johnson, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to talk specifically about the Butcher Block Act. Uh, the members will note uh, that we have offered an amendment in the nature of a substitute and that that's a part of this uh, in block package. Uh, they are largely technical fixes suggested by uh, TA from USDA. There are no substantial changes in the ANS. So I, I thank you all for allowing that to be included in the bill. So let's just back up half a minute and, and talk about the nature of these cattle markets. We know that uh, for producers to get a fair price and for consumers to get a fair price, you have to have equilibrium. Uh, these market forces are powerful. We know that we are about 6,000 head a day short of processing capacity in this country for us to reach that equilibrium. And I think a lot of us feel, frankly, that having as 85% uh, of the market in control of four large packers is also suboptimal. The Butcher Block Act, uh, which I have been uh, honored to work with Ms. Uh, Spanberger on, really addresses both of those issues. 
First off, by making uh, robust resources available to build additional capacity. And then secondly, to ensure that that capacity is built outside of the big four. Now, the administration looked at Johnson Spanberger uh, months ago. They decided they loved it. They have uh, put it into effect in large part. But we also want to make sure that we're doing our job in Congress and that we are codifying this good work that is getting done and that we make sure that this program is not just a, a flash in the pan connected to one administration or to one Congress, but is something uh, that we can continue to rely on to address these key supply and demand issues in the cattle market. I would ask uh, the committee to vote yes on the Butcher Block Act uh, and so as a, result, as a result vote yes on the uh, end block package. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I would yield back and certainly would make myself available uh, for questions, uh, if there are any. For what purpose does Mr. Harder of California seek recognition? Uh, thank you so much, Chairman right, Scott. Sir. Today, I'm proud to speak on my bill scheduled for markup, H.R. 7764. Uh, this bill is going to direct USDA to provide a temporary cost share of up to 100 percent for the planning and implementation of a nutrient management plan through the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, which we all know as, as EQIP. Specifically, this is going to provide 100% cost share for any producer practicing and implementing nutrient management through EQIP under the 590 standard. Uh, basically, it means that any farmer who works with NRCS to develop and implement a nutrient management plan for their operation will be getting access to these payments. This is more critical than ever as we've seen the cost of everything uh, go up around us and we know how much it's hurt our producers, uh, especially when they're trying to buy input like fertilizer. So as fertilizer prices surge, uh, folks need alternatives and this is going to help address this. It's also going to uh, further conservation practices. It's going to reduce fertilizer use, lower costs while also providing resource benefits like clean water and re, uh, reduced carbon use. And by partnering with a trusted program like EQIP, uh, a lot of our producers can get the peace of mind knowing that they're doing things that are good for their land and for their bottom line. So thank you, Chairman Scott and your team for helping us bring this uh, bill together to, for, for markup today. And uh, thank you to Rep Costa who has co-sponsored this bill and is a big supporter uh, as well. Uh, thank you so much and I, I yield back. Remember that seeks recognition. Oh, Mr. Davis of Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've, well, I'm glad to see several bills move through this committee today. I, I was disappointed that my bill, the Farm Credit Administration Independent Authority Act, which I introduced with my colleagues, Representatives Jimmy Panetta, Michelle Fishbach, Abigail Spanberger, and Angie Craig, I, I'm disappointed it wasn't included in this markup. Rural America's access to credit and a well-working farm credit system is key to our supply chains. And I'm disappointed that this hasn't been made a priority in our markup today. Our bill would have mitigated a serious threat to the viability of the farm credit system by clarifying the Farm Credit Administration as the independent regulator of the farm credit system. Stopping implementation of the CFPB's overreaching one-size-fits-all proposed rule on small business lending data collection. If we don't stop this rule from being implemented, farm credit lenders and borrowers will be subject to excessive, duplicative, and unnecessary reporting requirements that, at the end of the day, will demand new, costly IT infrastructure, additional staff, and will ultimately expect lenders uh, to guess the demographic information of a borrower in the name of fair lending if this is left unreported. There are much better ways to promote access to credit and we should preserve the Farm Credit Administration's authority in that regard, especially given the good track record of the system's effectiveness for rural communities. Given the limited amount of floor time that the speaker has given toward bills of value or substance related to agriculture in rural America, this is, this is a missed opportunity. Mr. Chairman, hope we can come to an agreement on this issue to ensure that at a time when inflation and ag input costs are skyrocketing with no end in sight, that our constituents have continued access to an efficient farm credit system that promotes their access to credit. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Is there anyone else seeks recognition? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Ms. Spanberger, for what purpose do you seek recognition? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I 
4140, the Butcher Block Act, uh, which I was proud to co-lead alongside my colleague, Dusty Johnson of South Dakota. So this is one of two pieces of legislation uh, that I am looking forward to ushering forward in today's markup that focuses squarely on reducing consolidation in the American meatpacking industry. As our committee heard just last month, we have consolidation and anti-competitive behaviors in this industry that have led to some stunning statistics regarding the share of revenues that make their way back to top producers. For instance, even as prices continue to soar for beef and cattle packers, um, for, for beef and as cattle packers report record profits, cattle producer share of retail value for beef has decreased from more than 51% in 2015 to less than 37% in 2021. Meanwhile, between cyber attacks, pandemic disruptions, and other stresses in the American food supply chain, we have seen that this issue of consolidation in our meatpacking industry is not just an economic threat to producers, but it is also a national security threat to the United States. I am concerned about the ability of foreign actors to potentially disrupt our egg sector, and this bill takes action. It's also an issue that matters immensely to Virginia's producers. I remember gut-wrenching calls from livestock producers during the early days of the pandemic who suffered severe losses and who were forced to cull animals because they could not be processed in a timely fashion. The lack of processing capacity hurts producers, it hurts consumers, and ultimately leaves America less food secure and economically secure. That's why I was proud to work with Rep. Johnson to introduce the Butcher Block Act, this legislation would establish a loan guarantee program focused on expanding small and medium-sized meat and poultry processing and packing plants across the nation. It is a critical step towards increasing competition and helps provide upfront capital. I was pleased that USDA recognized, as my colleague from South Dakota mentioned, the importance of setting up a program like this and chose to utilize funds from the American Rescue Plan to establish a similar program um, but by passing the Butcher Block Act, this committee can codify these efforts, ensure they continue beyond FY23, and provide additional guidance to USDA on how to best implement this financial assistance. Today, our meat and poultry producers are in crisis, and as we heard last month, America is losing a staggering 40 family cattle farms a day. I am proud to support this effort and to help address these concerns and ensure more competitions in the meat and poultry processing industry to benefit producers and consumers alike. I urge my colleagues to support this legislation and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Van Berger. Uh, is there any other member seeking recognition? Mr. Chairman, Kim Schreier. Yes. Ms. Schreier of Washington. Ms. Schreier of uh, Washington, you're not recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I am so glad to see the Agriculture Committee taking action to address the challenges of our nation's food supply chain. We've all had a rude awakening. I'm excited to support my colleague, Representative Craig's bill, HR 7675, which will help identify solutions for improving the security, safety, and resiliency of our supply chains. Um, this supply chain dysfunction was made worse by the pandemic, but it was first brought to my attention by hay farmers in Ellensburg, Washington, in my district back in 2020. And since then, I've been in frequent communication with growers and exporters all around the 8th District about the issues they're facing, hay, pears, you name it. For about two years, they've shared with me how pandemic conditions and the behavior of foreign-owned shipping carriers are hurting their industries, threatening export markets, and frankly, the relationships that they've built over decades. And once we lose a market, we may not get it back. Uh, the cost and availability of transportation to both domestic and export markets continue to be a challenge for wheat, cherry, apple, and pear growers also in my district. And as we all know, the rising input costs are putting even more pressure on farmers. Uh, this bill will urgently focus federal resources specifically on the strengths, the weaknesses, and the areas for improvement on our food supply chain. And it will ensure that USDA is consistently meeting with the farmers and the private sector so we can develop some collaborative solutions to stabilize our agriculture and food systems. We've got to do more to bring down prices for the American people and to shore up our supply chain. And frankly, shoring up the supply chain is a way to bring down prices. Uh, a comprehensive consideration of the ongoing disruptions will benefit consumers and producers. For example, 
Uh, addressing the shortage of trucking and other transportation availability uh, will allow farmers to get their crops to market more cheaply and more quickly. Uh, similarly, expanding the availability and capacity, and capacity of meat processing, like my colleague Dutch D. Johnson was just talking about, and Abigail Spamberger, um, you know, this bill and theirs will create new jobs, uh, provide more options for small and medium-sized ranching operations, like those in my district, and really help lower the cost of meat at the grocery store. Uh, creative solutions like the ones in this bill and several others that we're considering today are a real positive step toward easing burdens on producers and on my constituents and their pocketbooks. And I look forward to voting to pass them both out of committee and onto the House floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you. Any other member seeks a recognition? Ranking member, you're recognized. Well, Chairman, thank you. I've already expressed my, uh, certainly my support for 2518, the Precise Act, which is one of these five bills in the, um, uh, in this package, and uh, 2606, which is the Sustains Act. We just want to speak briefly on the other three bills that are there. Uh, HR 7764, you know, we know, you know, science, technology, innovation really is what defines American agriculture and has always been critical for success and sustainability of American agriculture. And improving soil health and encouraging better nutrient management are goals that you know, I believe every member of this committee shares. And I appreciate the work that was done on this bill and efforts to incorporate our comments on the bill. Um, you know, uh, a little more fuller vetting. I am com comfortable with where we're at, but it, and I'm gonna support the bill, but would request in the future we do more vetting uh, bef uh, before marking up. Um, and then uh, HR 4140, the, the Butcher Block Act, uh, you know, we all uh, have seen where the recent Marcus disruption, including the Holcomb plant fire, cyber attacks, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, and, and so many other black swan events have highlighted the importance of diversity and access to process capacity. And I really appreciate Mr. Johnson's passion for and early leadership on this matter. And I'm pleased to see USDA running uh, with this idea and hope that uh, the passage of this bill will ensure the continued success of that endeavor. So I urge my colleagues to uh, certainly support this legislation. Please, it's important the unanimous consent. And then finally, HR, the remaining bill, HR 76, 75 that is within uh, this uh, unanimous consent package is, um, you know, I, I appreciate my colleagues using this markup as another avenue to get this product across the finish line. Um, I, I don't think any of us would deny we, we need to ensure these fractures to our supply chain never happen again. And while this is not a near-term solution to today's issues, I do think there's value in bringing every player in the supply chain together to understand what went wrong, what repairs are necessary to avoid issues in the future, and most importantly, what, what, how can we make our food systems and supply chains as resilient as possible? And therefore, as long as the task force does not continue in uh, perpetuity, um, that we're able to get a sunset uh, 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 component with this bill. I support my colleagues' efforts and look forward to the final report, and I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member. Is there another member seeking recognition? Hearing none, as we've done before, I will make a single unanimous consent motion to discharge the agreed-upon bills. And so I ask unanimous consent that the Subcommittee on Commodities Exchanges, Energy and Credit that it be discharged from further consideration of H.R. 4140 and H.R. 2518. Without objection, so ordered. Now I ask unanimous consent that the following bills be adopted and ordered favorably reported as described to the House of Representatives. H.R. 4140, with an amendment in the nature of a substitute as filed by Mr. Johnson. And then H.R. 7675, with an amendment in the nature of a substitute filed by Ms. Craig. And then H.R. 
7764 and HR 2518 and HR 2606. And without objection, so ordered. And now I call up for consideration HR 7606, the Meat and Poultry Special Investigator Act of 2022, authored by our colleague from Virginia, Ms. Spanberger. Without objection, the Subcommittee on Livestock and Foreign Agriculture is discharged from further consideration of H.R. 7606. And now I recognize the sponsor of this bill, Ms. Spanberger, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Last month, we came together as a committee to hear from cattle producers about the immense challenges they have f faced in the past several years and their stunning resiliency in the face of ever-growing headwinds. Mr. Coy Young, a cattle calf, a calf, <laughs> a calf cattle producer from Missouri, bravely shared his experience of nearly taking his own life as he worked sun up to sundown to keep his family's operation afloat. His story is distressing, but too many producers, including in Virginia, understand the impossible choices he faced. During the hearing, we all expressed our deep concern for the current state of family-owned cattle operations. We also shared and contemplated some disturbing statistics, like since 1980, 40% of U.S. cattle producers have gone out of business. Meanwhile, last year, the big four meat packers raked in record profits. We heard that cattle producers' share of retail value for beef has decreased from more than 51% in 2015 to less than 37% in 2021. Meanwhile, and we have all seen this firsthand, meat prices are up 13% for consumers over the last year. This means many families are struggling to afford a nutritious diet, and all the while, large meat packers have squeezed competition out of the marketplace and increased their market consolidation. Today, we have an opportunity to advance meaningful legislation to enforce the laws we already have on the books surrounding illegal anti-competitive behavior. My bill, uh, the Meat and Poultry Special Investigator Act, which I introduced with Congresswoman Miller Meeks, would create an Office of the Special Investigator for Competition Matters in USDA's Office of the Secretary to strengthen enforcement of the Packers and Stockyards Act. This bill gives USDA better law enforcement tools through new litigation power. However, I want to reiterate, it does not change any existing rules, nor does it take any power away from other agencies or offices. It does not increase compliance costs for producers or packers. And contrary to what some have suggested, it does not create a new model of civil enforcement. Instead, it builds on models commonly utilized by federal agencies across industries, such as the financial systems. And frankly, unless a company is engaging in illegal anti-competitive behavior, they should not be opposed to this legislation. Members from both parties often argue that USDA is the best federal agency to handle issues related to agriculture, and I agree. And I think all of us on this committee agree, USDA is best suited to provide the technical assistance to farmers, best positioned to help farmers navigate crop insurance, and the list goes on. So why then are we deferring to other agencies when we are enforcing laws related to the agricultural industry that has a profound effect on America's farmers? USDA has the expertise, but it needs additional capacity to ensure we enforce the laws on the books. Colleagues from both parties, from all regions of the country, have consistently expressed skepticism of current enforcement of the Packers and Stockyards Act. We have also discussed frustration with the speed and capacity of the current investigations at the Department of Justice into the big four meat packers. We are coming up on the two-year anniversary of the DOJ launching an investigation, but we haven't gotten any substantive updates or answers. Meanwhile, America is losing a staggering 40 family cattle farms a day. We cannot continue to accept the status quo, and America's consumers cannot continue to accept higher prices and less 
secure food supply chains due to concentration. I encourage my colleagues to look past the misconceptions about this bill and think about the real positive impact it could have on family cattle producers and consumers in your districts. Some argue the bill would allow a partisan figure to take the helm of the office, despite USDA sharing that the bill is silent on whether the special investigator would be an appointee or a career employee. And today I will speak in favor of an amendment from my colleague, friend, and the chairman of the subcommittee, Representative Costa, to further clarify this position's classification because better enforcement of our laws is not a partisan issue, nor is it politically motivated. As a former federal law enforcement officer, I know the seriousness of an oath those serving uh, take to ensure that all parties are following the letter of the law. Others argue they are confident that the current enforcement authorities provided by the Packers and Stockyard Acts are adequate and provided they have the resources for enforcement, but they should open their eyes. The stunning statistics of increased control over the market, reduced share of retail profits, going to producers, and producer anecdotes paint a very different picture. And again, if companies are not engaging in anti-competitive behavior, why would they be averse to more sunlight on their operations? Can I have additional time? Yes. Okay. A few months ago, I was proud to host USDA leaders in Orange County in the district to meet with the Virginia Cattlemen's Association and Virginia cattle producers. They shared how the industry has changed and how anti-competitive practices by other entities in the supply chain have stacked the hand against them. As we all know, cattle producers are not complainers, but when they know an industry uh, that they have been in for generations has veered off course, they recognize it. And I am proud to have the Virginia Cattlemen's Association and the National Farmers Union as supporters of this bill. I encourage my colleagues to join me in advancing this legislation that looks out for family-owned cattle, poultry, pork, turkey, and other meat producers by ensuring we enforce our laws and streamline litigation where necessary. I encourage my colleagues to support this bipartisan legislation and the constituents in their districts who will be impacted rather than big special interests. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentlewoman for her comments. And before we begin on amendments, are there any members who wish to speak on the bill? Mr. Austin Scott of Georgia, you're recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm opposed to this piece of legislation. I've actually, uh, my grandfather and I actually had a lot of cows, and I don't understand how somebody who could write this piece of legislation thinking that it's going to actually help uh, the farmer or the cattle producer. I think it's uh, probably been written by somebody who, who's not been a farmer before, but I want to read part of this legislation so the general public understands what's in it. The special investigator shall have the authority to bring any civil or administrative action authorized under Packers and Stockyards Act. This is just another policing program under the USDA that's going to increase the cost of groceries on our constituents. If we want to have an honest debate about what's happening at the grocery store, let's have an honest debate about it. The Democratic Party doesn't like the energy industry. So the Democratic Party's taking actions that's raised the cost of energy inside the United States. Well, guess what? Everything we buy at the grocery store gets there from a, a truck, a truck that operates based on diesel. When we buy our meat, guess what? That meat's refrigerated. Well, guess what refrigeration takes? It takes energy. So any time and everything, every time the Democratic administration takes an action that raises the cost of diesel, raises the cost of energy, raises the cost of farming and getting food to our table, we're going to pay for it at the grocery store. This is a horrible piece of legislation. It should not pass. I, again, want to point out a special investigator, according to this, would have the authority to bring any, any civil or administrative action against the industry. I, I hope that we vote this piece of legislation down. I yield. All right. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Um, is there any other member that wishes to speak? Mr. Ms. Chairman. Custer, for what purpose does a gentlewoman have? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. I want to speak up here in support of this bill. The Special Investigator Act will provide additional resources and a dedicated office for oversight of packers and stockyard violations. 
The Packers and Stockyards Act was passed in 1921 to ensure that the large packing companies at this time were not partaking in anti-competitive practices. 100 years later, and we have some of the exact same concerns arising again. It's critical that the laws in existence be enforced and that this bill is one step in the right direction to ensure that that happens. And with that, I'll yield to Ms. Spamberger the balance of my time. Thank you very much to my colleague from New Hampshire. Um, and I, I want to follow up because I think the, the implication of the, the gentleman from Georgia's comments were that I'm not a cattle farmer, which I am not. Um, but I have a national security background and I'm a former law enforcement officer, so I'm uh, kind of resistant to the idea that anyone would not want to enforce the law as it is written, which is the purpose of this bill. But notably, on the Senate side, our Senate sponsors, Senator Tester, Senator Grassley, uh, Senator Tester himself, of course, uh, is a producer, has been the entirety of his life, speaks about it often. Um, and so we have an array of people who, in the industry, uh, recognize the incredible value of this. And, and I'll, at this point, hearken back to the Cattlemen's Association of Virginia, uh, who are incredible representatives of the small family cattle farms in Virginia's 7th District, across central Virginia, uh, who are struggling day by day, who are doing good work, and whose interests I represent every day that I am on Capitol Hill. And so it is with their encouragement, with their support, uh, that I continue to pursue this bill. And I'm grateful for the co-sponsorship and the leadership on the Senate side of Senators Tester, Grassley, uh, Rounds, Thune, Danes, Hoven, Booker, Heinrich Blumenthal, Klobuchar, Stabenow, Hyde-Smith, and Wyden, uh, all of whom have a very varied backgrounds um, in, in various different industries, including cattle ranchers. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Time belongs to the gentlewoman from New Hampshire. Mr. Chairman, I concur in the eloquent remarks of Ms. Spamberger, and I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Anyone else Mr. seek Chairman. recognition? Mr. Chairman. Either way. You want to go. David Rouser, North Carolina. For what purpose does the gentleman seek recognition? Um, Mr. Chairman, I just want to make a couple comments and also have a request to insert a letter for a record, which I'll get to in a second. Um, I think Gentlemen, that, it's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think my comments uh, by my friend and colleague uh, from Georgia, Austin Scott, are, are dead on. Uh, this is duplicative. It's not going to do anybody any good, uh, as well-intentioned as it may be, except uh, for most likely drive up inflation anymore even more uh, later on at a time when we're going to least afford it. Um, Mr. Chairman, I have a letter here in my hands from the American Farm Bureau Federation dated May 3rd of this year uh, to the leadership of the House Agriculture Committee and the Senate Agriculture Committee with a number of questions that I won't get into other than to say that they are very good, thoughtful questions that I think deserve to be answered. And I would uh, highly uh, suggest that uh, uh, the committee get these answers uh, before we go to the floor, uh, certainly in June or whenever it happens to be. I'd like to uh, insert uh, this letter for the record. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you. Does anyone else seek recognition? Mr. Thompson, for what purpose? Well, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I seek recognition to speak on H.R. 7606. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Regrettably, I have to express my strong opposition to the gentlelady's legislation. Unfortunately, it appears I correctly predicted that our recent Packer hearing was nothing more than an exercise in political theatrics designed to support unvetted and controversial bills uh, like this one. Based on my experience, additional layers of bureaucracy don't solve problems. If anything, they create new problems. And in this case, it's hard to even tell what alleged problem this legislation is aiming to solve. You know, is it consolidation? Well, if so, Packer concentration has been relatively steady for decades. And regardless, this bill does nothing to change that. Maybe it's supposed to address rising food prices. If so, it seems almost laughable that an unfunded office with duplicative authorities is going to solve that problem by filing lawsuits against packers at the whims of the secretary. 
What about a supposed lack of enforcement of the Packers and Stockyards Act? If so, USDA already has an entire Packers and Stockyards division charged with enforcing the act. And based on the latest available data, filed and closed almost 1,900 investigations in 2020 alone, the division already consists of teams of seasoned attorneys, market specialists, and auditors, and has the option to pursue administrative enforcement through USDA's Office of General Counsel before an administrative law judge or through the Department of Justice in federal court. Perhaps a lack of funding for enforcement is a problem. If so, despite the department's own budget request for more funding and full-time employees, this bill provides nothing. That leaves me concerned that the existing enforcement resources would have to be stretched even further to stand up this unnecessary duplicative office. One thing is for certain, the legislation is certainly not in response to widespread industry support. The National Cattlemen's Beef Association, the National Pork Producers Council, the National Chicken Council, the National Turkey Federation, and the North American Meat Institute are all in opposition. And the American Farm Bureau Federation, as you've heard, uh, uh, thanks to Mr. Rouser introducing a letter, has raised a litany of concerns and unanswered questions. So, Mr. Chairman, in your closing comment at the recent Packer hearing, you outlined your plans to partner with industry to, quote, find the right legislative solutions, end quote. Well, I'm afraid this partisan process that came out of the Senate and the resulting legislation couldn't be further from that. So I urge my colleagues to oppose this deeply flawed proposal, and I yield back the balance of my time. Um, Mr. Chairman? Does any other member wish to be recognized? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kelly? Mr. Is, Mr. Kelly of Mississippi, you're recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask for five minutes to speak in opposition to this, this, this bill. Gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I oppose this bill. This bill would create a duplicative, unfunded office within the office of the secretary, headed by a special investigator with a mandate to investigate packers and live poultry dealers. The investigator would be granted independent litigation authority, allowing them carte blanche power to file civil suits against packers at the whims of the secretary without any required coordination with DOJ. The office would also be responsible for liaising, liaising with DHS on cybersecurity issues. Mr. Chairman, we don't need more bureaucracy in the federal government. We do need to enforce the laws we have, but if Department of Justice needs more investigators, they need to be asking for us, not us, in the Agriculture Committee. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. Does any other member seek recognition? Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Pingree of Maine, for what purpose? Does the general lady seek recognition? Uh, I'd like five minutes to speak in favor of the bill. General lady is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'd like to yield my time to uh, Representative Spanberger. Ms. Spanberger, you're recognized. Thank you. Uh, some of the comments related to this bill have been that the bill would be duplicative and that it would create some level of redundancy. Um, but the purpose of this, and, and I gave an example in my opening comments, is that um, we have already seen for two years now the Department of Justice is investigating uh, potential violations of Stockyard and Packers Act, but yet we have no updates. It's two years without uh, any movement, and it's due to a lack of expertise. And the Office of the Special Investigator will help coordinate strategy with various offices within USDA and with DOJ, empowering USDA to put people who actually understand agriculture in a stronger position to oversee the industry and enforce the law. We know that DOJ is expected to oversee an overwhelming number of industries and they only have but so much capacity to bring cases forward. And given the data of changes to the industry uh, and that has been so glaring, producers and consumers really deserve an investigative entity that is focused on a narrow and specific level of expertise and allowing USDA to work in concert with DOJ is important. Uh, there's been comments that some of the national groups uh, oppose this piece of legislation, but certainly I would comment that regulated industry 
um, is, 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 does not necessarily have a is, uh, history of being supportive of stronger enforcement. However, the bill does have the support of many cow-calf producers and the National Farmers Union. The bill does not expand on what constitutes a violation of the act, the existing law. It does not expand what constitutes a violation of the existing law. It simply elevates the role of enforcement and oversight of competition matters at the department and enhances USDA's enforcement tools. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The time belongs to the gentleman from Maine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I yield back. As You're well. quite welcome. Uh, for what purpose does the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Allen, seek recognition? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I request five minutes to speak in opposition to this bill. Gentleman is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Georgia, as you probably know, is a leading state in the nation in terms of broiler production and poultry production, and processing are vital to the economy of both uh, the state and at large in my district. Uh, I've had multiple uh, of my constituents reach out to express their concerns with this bill and to explain how detrimental and duplicative it would be to the Georgia poultry industry. USDA already has a longstanding group of seasoned lawyers under current law charged with enforcing the PSA with the authority to investigate practices and, if needed, bring administrative action to force compliance. This bill would duplicate the enforcement functions already in place at USDA, adding more bloat and cost to the federal bureaucracy. Currently, when USDA wishes to initiate civil action against a processor, it calls on the Department of Justice. The applicable U.S. Attorney's Office then coordinates cases across the department to ensure an alignment of priorities and resources. This is not a special aspect of the PSA or USDA. Most federal agencies work through DOJ in this manner when bringing civil actions. This bill would upend this well-established framework, bypassing DOJ with a single political appointee given free power to file lawsuits in federal courts. The result would be the confusion of the law enforcement chain of command undermining of DOJ's rule, role as the litigation arm of the federal government and could risk confusion and misapplication of resources. Finally, this bill would complicate cybersecurity coordination across the U.S. government. If it is signed into law, this bill would charge this office of the special investigator for com competition matters with liaising with uh, DHS on cybersecurity issues. It is highly unlikely a PSA attorney would have any cybersecurity experience. This legislation would negatively impact 48 chicken facilities in Georgia alone and 474 across the United States. As a senior advisor at USDA said in April 27th uh, Senate Ag hearing, between 2010 and today there has been a 40% decline in the staffing in the packers and stockyards. Rather than pr pursue this duplicative, costly, and misguided bill, Congress should seek to fulfill the President's FY 2023 budget request for oversight and enforcement of the Packers and Stockyards Act. Simply enforce the law on the books. Mr. Chairman, I ask for unanimous consent to enter into the record a letter from the National Chicken Council and the Georgia Poultry Federation. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you. Uh, for what purpose does the gentlewoman from Florida Ms. Carmack, seek recognition. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I seek recognition to speak for five minutes in opposition to this bill. The gentlewoman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This bill confers extremely broad and new enforcement authority <coughs> at a time when USDA is writing new rules for the Packers and Stockyards Act. In 2010, at the time, Secretary Vilsack wrote Packers and Stockyards rules. Congress had to stop them in multiple appropriations bills. How can we authorize more enforcement when yes. we haven't even seen the new rules? How can you be sure that litigation by the special investigator enforcing the new rules will not result in higher costs for producers and consumers, especially at a time with record inflation? I'm deeply concerned about impacts of how these new rules would impact everyone in the supply chain, particularly after those, after so many of those who will be impacted have come out in strong opposition so, to this bill. I'm not just talking about the major processors. 
I'm talking about livestock producers like those in Florida. After all, we are the number two in the country for cow-calf operations. And I am speaking today on their behalf. There's a lot of questions that my colleagues have raised that I believe are valid that speak to the industry and with knowledge. So I hope those go addressed. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Carmack. And now does uh, any other member seek recognition? Mr. Chair, I, speak rec I seek recognition. For what purpose does the general lady from Connecticut seek recognition? I'd like to yield, I'd seek five minutes to speak on this issue. The general lady is recognized. I'd like to yield my time to the general lady from Virginia, Ms. Spamberger. Ms. Spambacher, you're recognized. Five thank, minutes. Thank you so much to my colleague from Connecticut. Uh, I, I, I keep hearing people say that this would be somehow unique or that it would provide some unusual level uh, to the change to the way that, that this would be put in place. But indeed, um, there are other agencies that have a similar construct that work in concert with DOJ. Um, so this isn't actually unusual for a premise, it's recognizing the unique nature of our cattle markets, of our livestock markets, and bringing in the expertise that exists within USDA. FTC, SEC, the US Postal Service, they can bring civil cases. So in fact, this is something that frankly should have been done a long time ago to ensure that we were allowing DOJ the coordination and resources and the knowledge that exists within USDA. The idea that this might take away somehow resources from USDA's other work, nonsense. The Special Investigator's Office does not take any funding from the Packers and Stockyards Division. That's one of the benefits of locating it within the Secretary's Office. We've also heard worries that this might somehow become a partisan or a political issue. Well, that is why I am so pleased that we will uh, ideally be accepting Mr. Costa's amendment, which would ensure for clarity's sake that this is a career position. Again, someone who has worked within USDA on behalf of our nation's producers uh, for their career and that they are bringing their extensive knowledge and understanding to this coordination with DOJ. Uh, hearing some concerns about what this might mean for the ability uh, to get after cyber attacks and challenges related to cybersecurity. Well, we've seen from the JBS cyber attack that concentration at the packing level is a threat to our food supply. Coordinating with DHS will allow USDA and DHS to share information on how concentration in the livestock production uh, industry may be a national security threat and how we can protect critical infrastructure like meatpacking and processing from targeted attacks. And on the issue of whether there would be an increased compliance cost, and I cannot urge you all to, to really take this issue on um, enough, there are no increased compliance costs if you are not violating the law. If you are not violating the Stockyards and Packers Act, there should be no issue here. So when we're looking at what this bill does and what it will do, it is allowing for USDA to coordinate with DOJ to ensure that a law that decades ago our predecessors believed was necessary because of illegal activity and anti-competitive behaviors occurring within the marketplace, this bill would ensure that those laws that predate our service here are actually enforced. And there is no additional compliance cost so long as we are not just doing the bidding for those who are trying to violate the law. And I certainly am not here to do that, so I urge my colleagues again to vote for this very bipartisan piece of legislation. Thank you. Uh, the remainder of the time is uh, for the general lady from Connecticut. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I yield back. All right, is there any other member that seeks recognition? 
Mr. Costa, you are recognized. For what purpose does uh, the gentleman seek recognition? Uh, I move to strike uh, the last word for the purpose of offering an amendment. Yes. Gentleman is recognized. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for putting together uh, uh, this uh, package of bills. I think they're important as we move the committee's work forward. And I want to commend the author, uh, Ms. Spamberger, uh, for her efforts, her tireless efforts, uh, on trying to deal with um, issues that have been contentious uh, among uh, the uh, uh, livestock, uh, uh, poultry uh, uh, issues, uh, industries across the country. Um, and we've heard a lot about the Packers and Stockyard Act uh, and its enforcement uh, and uh, its um, uh, uh, <clears throat> challenges that it's brought in uh, producers throughout the country, especially those uh, in some areas and, and depending upon their size. My amendment would require the special investigator uh, to be a senior career employee. Uh, for members of the committee who uh, uh, may not be aware, a senior career employee our senior executive service. Therefore, they would not be a political appointee. Uh, the purpose being is to try to take the politics out of this. Uh, let's be clear, this amendment I think is helpful to this bill to ensure the critical oversight for the Packers and Stockyard Act. Uh, this position cannot, should not be politicized no matter who's in the White House. Any additional oversight such as this bill to strengthen enforcement should be done through the purpose of upholding the law, as uh, Congresswoman Spenberger indicated. That was the intent, uh, not through partisan lenses. Um, I, I think it's also important to note that um, uh, how difficult this COVID-19 pandemic has been upon American agriculture at every level, uh, from the producers uh, to the uh, processors uh, and the employees who every day work so hard to put food on America's dinner table, which is a national security issue. Uh, there is other pieces of legislation that have been noted over on the Senate side and others that are moving. I view this as a work in progress. I want to encourage the author to, to stay with it. Um, uh, I hope as the chairman indicated at the end of the last hearing, that we can work our differences out on this. Uh, that has been the tradition of the House Ag Committee. Uh, while we may have our differences to be sure, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that the uh, cost of, of, of groceries in American uh, uh, stores uh, are a result of multiple factors. Uh, obviously, this inflationary uh, period is, is is, I think, worrisome for all of us. And uh, we have to do what we can to uh, knock down this inflationary rise uh, so that American consumers uh, can continue to uh, feel comfortable about uh, putting food on America's dinner table every night. So this is an attempt to deal with a part of that effort. Uh, and uh, I think as our nation continues to deal with the challenges of COVID-19, and we're not out of the woods yet, <clears throat> to be sure, uh, we must continue to make sure that we're resilient and we use all of the best management practices, whether it's uh, on the farm or whether it's in the processing facility. Uh, we all have a lot of farms and processing facilities in our district, or whether it's getting on that truck, uh, that product to the grocery store. It's all part of a very complex, complicated food supply chain that uh, right now is being challenged in ways we could never have anticipated uh, uh, years ago. So with that, I uh, uh, would like to offer my amendment uh, with good intentions and continue to work with the author uh, as we move forward. And uh, I'll yield back the balance of my time. Uh, Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Costa, do you have an amendment at the desk? Yes. The clerk will report the title of the amendment. Amendment number one to H.R. 7606, offered by Mr. Costa of California. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. Um, does anyone else wish to speak on the <coughs> amendment? Chairman. Ranking member, you're recognized. Chairman, thank you very much. And I want to thank my colleague, Mr. Costa, for attempting to be responsive to one of the many stakeholder concerns of, of this legislation. Um, uh, however, I am under no illusion that a career employee 
uh, would operate outside the direction of the secretary. And this administration has made it very clear their intention mm -hmm. to continue harassing the Packers and blaming them for everything from the spread of COVID, quite frankly, through the skyrocketing inflation of food prices. And as, as Mr. Koss said, there are many issues out there that have contributed to the increase in food prices that people are experiencing. Unfortunately, this amendment does nothing to address my concerns about duplicative nature of this office or the, or the near unprecedented independent litigation authority that inexplic inexplicably comes along with it. Um, we, uh, you know, we're gonna see, you know, with, re with regulatory compliance brings increased costs. And that's really what, you know, if that's the underlying factor, um, I don't, how you couch it, when you add more compliance, it requires staff time, people time, uh, staff hours, paperwork in order to, re and that, that can, the only place that winds up is the price and the groceries. That's the only place where you, you capture it in the end. And it also, this is the kind of thing of how we wound up with the consolidation we have, which was the government imposing um, regulations decades ago, and I'm not saying they were bad regulations, but they were imposed and in the end, what we wound up with was small and medium-sized processors that could not deal, uh, did not have an economy of scale, and there we wound up with consolidation. And so I'm concerned. So while this amendment is a small step in the right direction, and I'm supportive of this amendment, it doesn't go far enough to fix this misguided legislation. With that, I yield back to balance my time. Thank you, Ranking Member. Is there anyone else who would you speak on the amendment? For what purpose does uh, Ms. Spanberger? Mr. Chairman, I would like to speak in support of the amendment offered by my friend and colleague, Mr. Costa, who is the chairman of the Livestock and Foreign Agriculture Subcommittee. Uh, and I'm proud to serve on that subcommittee. The amendment would clarify that under this bipartisan legislation, the newly established role of special investigator at USDA would be a career position. While USDA has shared that the current language is silent on whether the position would be an appointee or a career senior employee. Uh, employee. I support the amendment to clarify the classification of this position uh, so that we can ensure quick passage in committee and ultimately on the floor. Stronger enforcement of our existing laws really should not be a partisan issue or politically motivated. As a former federal law enforcement officer, I know the seriousness uh, with which our law enforcement entities and prosecutors take uh, their role in enforcing the law. Um, but regarding the issue of how uh, being in compliance should be expensive or having more requirements for compliance, this is not an issue of additional laws or regulations to which an entity should be compliant. Uh, in fact, everyone should already be in compliance because it's already the law. So it only creates more costs uh, if one is not in compliance with existing laws. And years ago, these regulations were put in place, and so I'd offer to any colleagues that have issues with the existing law, be it Stockyards and Packers Act or any other red tape that might exist, I look forward to partnering with anyone uh, to cut down and cut back on challenges, red tape, or hurdles that may exist uh, but surely this doesn't mean that we're just trying to undermine the ability of law enforcement or investigators to be able to ensure that we are in compliance with existing law. Um, notably, in a 2006 GAO report on the Grain Inspection Packers and Stockyards Administration, uh, which is responsible uh, for the Packers and Stockyard Acts, GAO noted, noted that the investigations were planned and conducted primarily by economists without formal involvement of attorneys from USDA's Office of General Counsel, and as a result, a legal perspective that focused on accessing, uh, assessing potential violations was generally absent uh, when the investigations were initiated. Uh, this is precisely why this bill is so important, because it elevates an issue that has not had enough scrutiny and ensures that attorneys will be responsible for looking into possible violations and that someone from within USDA with a knowledge is working with DOJ. Uh, 
Uh, USDA employees are experts on the issues facing farmers and producers, and I believe in their ability to lead thorough investigations and, if appropriate, civil legal action. As I've mentioned, the goal of this legislation is to ensure the enforcement of the Packers and Stockyards Act by giving USDA better enforcement tools, not to change existing law, not to increase existing regulation. But we cannot continue to accept the status quo where market consolidation is increasing, producer share of the retail price is decreasing, and most concerningly, family cattle farmers are going out of business at an alarming rate. This legislation takes a proactive approach to improving enforcement through the new Office of the Special Investigator for Competition Matters, and those who are leading and staffing this new office will be qualified based on their expertise and their ability to enforce the Packers and Stockyards Act. And this amendment aligns with this important goal. Notably, the U.S. Cattlemen's Association is also an endorser of this legislation, presumably because their membership is already in line with existing law, already in compliance with existing law. This bill simply makes it more straightforward for us to be able to enforce that law by ensuring that the experts and the knowledge base at USDA is leveraged as part of that process. I thank Chairman Costa for offering this amendment that brings clarity to the nature of this role, and I urge my colleagues to support this amendment, uh, which will strengthen the underlying legislation. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the remainder of my time. Thank you. Does anyone else want to speak? For what purpose does the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Austin Scott, seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I'm going to strike the last word. Gentlemen's recognized. Well, if you've listened to the last five minutes, it's pretty clear that a, that a career government employee can have a political agenda. And I think that's our concern with this piece of legislation, Mr. Chairman, is that you have somebody, uh, whether they be a senior career employee or not, that has a political agenda. Currently, you've got the Federal Trade Commission that can investigate this. You've got the Justice Department that can investigate this. If it's a publicly traded uh, company, I feel sure the SEC would have the jurisdiction to investigate any illegal or anti-competitive behavior. And so what we have here is a piece of legislation where you already have three federal agencies that have the ability to investigate any criminal or anti-competitive conduct. Uh, that this is a political agenda, and you know the amendment does very little to fix the problems with the legislation. A senior career employee can certainly have a political agenda, and under this administration, I expect that they would. Uh, now, the American citizens, every time they go to the grocery store, they get kicked in the teeth because of bad policy. It's been bad economic policy that's driven inflation. They go, to, they go to the gas station, they get kicked in the gut, and it's bad policy towards the American domestic energy production. This is just going to hurt. This is just going to lead to more consolidation in the industry because only the biggest of the big are going to be able to survive. It's going to lead to higher costs on industry. It's going to lead to fewer choices for the consumer and the American farmer, and it's going to lead to higher costs at the grocery store. Mr. Chairman, the bill is bad, the amendment is irrelevant, and um, I yield the remainder of my time. Thank you. Does any other member seek recognition? Hearing no further. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Yes. Chairman, hi, this Who's, is uh, Chantel Brown, Rep. Brown. For what purpose does Ms. Brown, the general lady from Ohio, seek recognition thank you mr chairman i would like uh to have five minutes on the record and i'd like to yield it to my colleague uh, Ms. bamberger mr bamberger you're recognized thank you i would like to use this time and i thank the gentlewoman from ohio for yielding uh to to just affirm my faith in law enforcement affirm my faith in the department of justice and affirm my faith in those who serve our country in agencies working on behalf of the American people. Um, and so ensuring that DOJ and USDA can work together to enforce laws that are on the books to ensure 
that bad actors are not breaking those laws, um, I, I really continue to just be a little bit struck by the level of opposition that so many of my colleagues appear to have when it comes to enforcing existing laws. Um, but I did want to have a follow-up question, and I would love to uh, yield to the gentleman from Georgia, uh, the, dis the assertion that this would lead to consolidation. Um, you know, my background is in intelligence, and my background is in law enforcement, uh, so it's not in a economics. Could, could the gentleman please uh, explain how this would yield to consolidation? Absolutely. And if you had been in the private sector, you wouldn't have to ask such a question. But the more that you increase the cost of doing business, the harder you make it Reclaiming on the small and the mid-sized businesses. If the gentleman in part of his uh, explanation would say how you're increasing the cost of doing business, because presumably every producer you represent is already abiding the law, so there would be no additional actions necessary to abide the law. So where would the increase in uh, compliance costs come from? When you, when you have, through your political agenda, created another mechanism where you're going to investigate a company, when you already have the ability to investigate them, if there is a problem through the Federal Trade Commission... Reclaiming my time. Um, looking at well, then the, keep your damn time. Some of the other programs that General, we use well. under the USDA, would it perhaps also then be advisable to move some of the other programs that fall within USDA to DOJ, to SEC, to FCC? What we are doing with this legislation is recognizing that there is an expertise within USDA that should be leveraged to the benefit of farmers and producers as we, presumably everyone in this room, would want to see the law enforced. There is a law on the books that prohibits anti-competitive behavior. We have seen through the data and certainly throughout history that DOJ, while it does have investigations and efforts into looking into these systems uh, underway, there's been no progress. You're and trying so, to create a scapegoat for your failed economic policies. Pause the Reclaiming my time. Pause, pause. It's, it's just... Well, let, um, please. Well, she asked me a question. If she asked me a question, did I not get the right I, to answer it? Reclaiming I my understand. time. It's very democratic of her. All I, uh, please. All I'm asking is that the questions come through me. Okay. I will recognize you, and then I will recognize you. Is she asking uh, me a Mr. question? Mr. Chairman, reclaiming my time, I'm no longer question, asking the gentleman from, Hold on. from Georgia a question. The time belongs to Ms. Spanberger, and then if the gentleman from uh, Georgia, Mr. Scott, would like to be heard, please, uh, you can direct that through me. Please let all inquiries come through me. Thank you. Thank, thank, Ms. You. Ms. thank you, Mr. Chairman. Spanberger, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, going back to the amendment that's put forward, uh, I think it's a strong amendment because it leverages the strength and the knowledge base that exists within USDA as we go about the process of enforcing laws on the books to the benefit of producers across the country uh, who are endeavoring every single day to follow the law, to be compliant with existing law. There's no additional regulation here. There's no additional efforts. There's no additional hurdles put in the way of producers. There's indeed a desire to bring forth the expertise that already exists within USDA and leverage that to the benefit of DOJ's investigations, to leverage that to the benefit of farmers and producers that spend the extra time, the effort, and the energy, and in fact, perhaps the money to be compliant with existing law. Any efforts to say that this is duplicative are wrong. Any efforts to say this create costs are wrong because every producer should be already in compliant. But if they are not, the law needs to be respected and there needs to be the resources to be able to investigate malfeasance. That's what this bill will do. I believe that Mr. Costa's amendment makes it stronger. For that reason, I support it. Uh, to my colleague from Ohio, thank you for yielding your time. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back the remainder of my time. The remaining time remind, remains with the general lady from Ohio. Does the, Does the general lady yield back? Yield back, yes, yes, Mr. Chairman, I yield very, back. Very good. Is there any other member? For what purpose does the gentleman from 
Mississippi seek recognition? To speak in support of the amendment, Mr. Chairman, for five minutes. The gentleman's recognized. Mr. Chairman, it would be very easy if people could take a win. I heard our ranking member say, although it doesn't go far enough, I support this amendment. At that point, we may not need to talk about the underlying bill again, and we may want to talk about the amendment which he supported rather than trying to go back and talk about the underlying bill. With that, I support this amendment, and I move forward. And your comments make perfect sense. Does there any other member seek recognition? Hearing no further discussion, the question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from California, Mr. Costa. All those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed by saying no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. Okay. Is there any further amendments or debate on the bill? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Who seeks recognition? Uh, Mr. Panetta from California. You're Mr. Panetta, you're recognized to offer your amendment. Thank you. Will the clerk Is it at the desk? Yes, sir. Amendment number two. To the clerk will report. Amendment number two to H.R. 7606, offered by Mr. Panetta of California. Mr. Chairman, may I go? Yes. Thank you. Without objection. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to amend H.R. 7606, the Meat and Poultry Special Investigator Act, the one, the bill that's been introduced by my colleague and friend, Representative Spanberger to insert on page three after line four the following. Quote, in carrying out the requirements of this subsection, the special investigator shall coordinate with the Office of the General Counsel and the Packers and Stockyards Division of the Agricultural Marketing Service, unquote. And then add to page three after line 15 the following. Quote, notification, period. With respect to any of the actions brought under this subsection in federal district court, the special investigator shall notify the attorney general. Mr. Chairman, over recent months and even years, it's clear that consolidation within the meatpacking industry has gone largely unchecked. I know that it is in the best interest of each member of this committee to work together with industry and producers to find a solution that provides transparency and accountability, not only to our producers and processors, but also to our consumers realizing higher prices at home. Now, just this year, JBS, one of the largest meat packers in the business, agreed to a $52.5 million settlement in a beef, beef price-fixing lawsuit where grocers and wholesalers accused the company of working together to suppress the number of cattle being slaughtered starting in 2015 to drive up the price of beef. To date, the DOJ has been investigating potential price fixing in the industry since 2020, but it has yet to provide any updates on its findings. While many factors may have played into this rise in price, such as supply and demand factors, it's also clear from the delays at the Department of Justice in investigating and adjudicating these cases of anti-competitive behaviors, additional resources and cooperation on behalf of the Department of Agriculture is necessary. Now, H.R. 7606 aims to strengthen enforcement of the Packers and Star Stockyards Act by creating a special liaison between the USDA and the DOJ, the Department of Homeland Security, and the Federal Trade Commission with respect to com competition and trade practices and allowing the newly created Office of Special Investigator for Competition Matters at USDA to be able to bring civil actions under the Packyards and Stockyards Act. This amendment clearly outlines that, special, that the special investigator must work with the Packers and Stockyards Division in AMS, the Office of the General Counsel, and notify the AG of any civil actions in federal court. This helps ensure that the investigator is coordinating with other enforcement entities, both within the USDA and at the DOJ. Now, I've heard concerns that this bill may duplicate enforcement efforts. This amendment makes sure that the offices across both the USDA and other parts of the executive branch are actually communicating and coordinating on addressing 
anti-competitive behaviors in the marketplace. While I agree that the increased enforcement and attention should be given to addressing these behaviors that are contributing to the outrageous rise in food prices across our country, I also recognize that packers and producers must be part of the solution and not, let me say that again, and not the enemy of this committee or any <coughs> government agency. It's up to us to ensure this coordination is timely, efficient, and solutions oriented. This bill already specifies that the special investigator will consult and liaise with other parts of the government, and my amendment clarifies and enhances that coordination. I urge all members to vote yes on this amendment, and in doing so, we will be able to work towards our ultimate goal of supporting the agricultural industry by creating a fair playing field for our farmers and ranchers and protecting consumers oh, okay. from unnecessary hikes in food prices, especially at a time when the American people need it the most. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to speak on the amendment? I have a Who seeks recognition? Mr. Chairman. I have a question. Well, what purpose does the gentleman move, move to strike the last word? I have a, I have a question right. for my friend and colleague, Mr. Panetta. Why would, so, so if this passes, you're going to have a federal agency with subpoena powers using what they garner under their subpoena powers to bring a civil action. Why would you want them to report a civil action to the Department of Justice? Wouldn't, isn't the Department of Justice only involved in criminal actions? I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm honestly asking you a question. Um, yeah. Does the gentleman yield to Mr. Panetta? Does the gentleman yield to Mr. Panetta? Yeah, if it's a criminal action, I get it. But if it's a civil action, what role would the Department of Justice play in it? Does the gentleman yield? Does the gentleman yield? Yes. Well, I, I think, um, Mr. Scott, this, uh, in regards to this bill, it's the amendment. All the amendment mm -hmm. does is help coordinate strategy with the various offices within the USDA and DOJ. It basically empowers USDA and puts people who understand agriculture in a stronger position to oversee the industry. So I, I, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but I'm just trying to explain the point of this amendment is to enhance and ensure coordination that is timely, efficient, and solutions oriented. And let me remind and members that we want to address your questions to Mr. Pendetta's amendment, not the overriding bill. That's what it was. Okay, just want to make sure. Who else seeks recognition? Oh, it was. Belonged to you, the time. Would you yield back? All right. Who else seeks recognition? Ms. Um, Spanberger of Virginia, you're recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, and as follow-up, uh, well, I, I, I want to speak in support of the amendment offered by uh, Mr. Panetta. This amendment would clarify the role of the Office of the Special Investigator, the role that it plays in coordinating with USDA Office of General Counsel and Packers and Stockyards Division, and establishes the requirement that when the Special Investigator takes action in court, the office provides notification to the Attorney General. I support this amendment to further clarify that the Office of the Special Investigator should coordinate with other entities that have similar, though not identical, missions and enforcement roles. As I've shared, the Office of the Special Investigator will help coordinate strategy with multiple offices within USDA and within DOJ. Empowering USDA puts people who understand agriculture in a stronger position to oversee the meatpacking industry without compromising current enforcement tools or adding to compliance costs. This will streamline investigations and enforcement, which will benefit the Packers and Stockyards Division, OGC, and DOJ's work as well. This will also ensure that federal investments in enforcement are used effectively and efficiently. In other industries, we frequently see coordination between the Department of Justice and other federal agencies to investigate and pursue claims related 
to that specific industry. For example, the Securities and Exchange Commission has civil enfor enforcement authority and coordinates closely with law enforcement agencies uh, under the Department of Justice. This is a common model across federal government, and this amendment further clarifies the bill's intent for strong coordination. I know there's some concerns and questions from some of our colleagues about how the Special Investigator's Office would interact with existing efforts at the DOJ and the Packers and Stockyards Division to investigate and enforce the Packers and Stockyards Act, and I hope this amendment will help answer and clarify those questions. With this amendment, the legislation unequivocally requires coordination between the Office of the Special Investigator with the Packers and Stockyards Division and the Office of the General Counsel. Additionally, the amendment would require the special investigator notify the attorney general of any actions taken in federal court. This is in addition to the existing language in the bill that directs the special investigator to act as the department liaison to and act in consultation with the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission. The bill is clear that coordination is not just expected but required. Coordination and consultation between federal agencies, particularly related to legal action, is both common and common sense. I encourage my colleagues to support this amendment and the bill to ensure its quick passage. And as follow-up and in reference to a question previously uh, asked of my colleague, Mr. Panetta, the Department of Justice has a criminal division and a civil division. It is within their mandate and the civil division website on doj.gov outlines the sort of civil litigation that is in fact part and parcel of what they do in addition to and complementing their criminal investigative work. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. For what purpose does the ranking member, gentleman from Pennsylvania? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I rise uh, to speak in favor of Mr. Panetta's amendment. Gentleman is recognized. Well, thank you. Um, now, I do rise in support of Ms. Panetta's amendment while uh, ha continuing to have, uh, even with its hopeful adoption, um, the under concerns with the underlying legislation. You know, I was shocked to learn that supposed technical assistance from the administration led to this version of the bill that creates a completely new office with absolutely no consideration of the existing offices already tasked with enforcing the Packers and Stockyards Act. Um, uh, so I, I want to thank Mr. Panetta for attempting to address that glaring flaw by recognizing the important work already carried out by the Packers and Stockyards Division and the Office of General Counsel. Uh, I would also like to hope that at bare minimum, USDA uh, would make the Department of Justice aware of its plans to pursue civil litigation in federal court. So I think codifying that requirement makes sense as well. However, despite the many hours that this committee has devoted to these important livestock marketing issues, I've never heard once from a witness uh, uh, here in this chamber or, quite frankly, in uh, at many, many roundtables around the country that I've had with folks involved in the livestock industry express a need, a uh, supposed need, for independent litigation authority. Um, requests from my staff about the need for that authority and what it would entail have gone ignored. And I'd like, and I would certainly be interested to hear the Department of Justice's thoughts on the matter. Rather than enforcing enhancing enforcement of the laws on the books, as I have long advocated, I and many of our stakeholders worry this unprecedented authority would upend a well-established framework creating unwarranted confusion and the misapplication of scarce resources. Again, I thank the gentleman from California for his amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak on the amendment? Hearing no further discussions, the question now is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from California, Mr. Costa. I'm sorry, Mr. Panetta. All those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed by saying no. In the opinion of the chair, the eyes have it, and the amendment is not agreed to, is agreed to. A recorded, oh, is there another further, one? Is there any further debate? 
or discussion on the bill. Is there any further debate or discussion on the bill? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Amendment number three. Mr. Riser has an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number three to H.R. 7606, offered by Mr. Rouser. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read, and Mr. Costa is recognized for five minutes on the amendment. Or Mr. Rouser. Mr. Rouser. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. All my names to make sense. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Biden administration is expected to publish new rules on defini definitions under Packard's and Stockard's Act, often referred to as the GYPSA rules. The new rules will likely state USDA's position on whether harm to competition must be established in order to bring suit under the Packard's and Stockard's Act, and the definitions of key terms under sections 202A and 202B of the Act. These rules, if similar to the Obama era proposed rules, and we expect they will be, have the potential to dramatically reshape USDA's position on the proper interpretation of the Packers and Stockyards Act. Now in 2010, uh, when similar uh, GYPSA rules were first proposed, the industry estimated, and this was uh, done by Informa Economics, they, con they conducted an economic analysis of the 2010 proposed rule from the National Cattlemen's Beef Association and the National Pork Producers Council and estimated the cost to the beef and pork industries to be nearly 1.5 billion. A separate analysis of the chicken industry estimated a five-year cost of 1.37 billion. And in response, there were 115 members of Congress that sent a letter to Secretary Vilsack stating that the proposed rule went beyond the mandate of the 2008 Farm Bill and would cause major changes in livestock and poultry marketing. Coincidentally, I have a copy of that letter dated October the 1st, 2010, and the great Colin Peterson was a signatory, the great Frank Lucas was a signatory, and the great David Scott was a signatory uh, to this letter, <laughs> which I'll quote, says, in order for Congress and the public to evaluate this rule and its implications with full transparency, a thorough economic analysis is necessary our constituents need this analysis in order to participate in the rulemaking process in a meaningful way. Now, how does that relate to the amendment? This amendment would require the special investigator to request an economic analysis from the USDA Office of the Chief Economist of the upcoming Packers and Stockyard Rules and to publicly post the results of, those, of that analysis 90 days prior to the rules being officially proposed. So in essence, Mr. Chairman, uh, this amendment does exactly what you and many other members of Congress uh, wanted to have done uh, 12 years ago when uh, this set of rules uh, were, on the, uh, were on the forefront, and we certainly uh, expect that a uh, similar set of rules uh, to be proposed later this year to be almost identical uh, to those. And so that's the purpose of the amendment. And certainly, uh, this inspector with the powers they're going to have, obviously, they're going to be heavily involved in the enforcement of these rules, and so it's a very uh, timely and important amendment. I yield back. Does anyone else wish to speak on the amendment? <coughs> Ms. Spanberger, for what purpose? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to speak in opposition to this amendment. The gentleman is recognized. Uh, I, I would like to speak in opposition to this amendment um, because it's actually adding a really unrelated requirement that is unrelated to the text of this bill. Uh, so this amendment would require the USDA Office of the Chief Economist to provide a cost-benefit analysis on upcoming rulemaking from USDA under the Packers and Stockyards Act. And I, I think that the gentleman raised uh, important and legitimate concerns about upcoming rulemaking from USDA. Uh, and, and certainly reference some of our colleagues who have uh, along the way expressed uh, a desire to have cost-benefit analysis related to rulemaking. Um, but that has nothing to do with this legislation. Um, this legislation uh, for which the gentleman's putting forth this amendment has nothing to do with rulemaking um, that is under, that's being undergone over at USDA. 
And so this amendment is, is simply a poison pill that would create redundancy at USDA and, and be separate and apart from the purpose of this legislation. Um, I, I do note that economic analysis is already part of USDA's rulemaking process. Um, but surely, uh, if the gentleman would like to move forward with this as a standalone piece of legislation, uh, I, I think there would probably be many members of this committee on both sides of the aisle who would support that. Uh, but this amendment offered here today has no bearing on the purpose of the uh, bill. It is unrelated to changes in rulemaking that we are expecting from USDA. Um, and because it is irrelevant uh, to the legislation that we're looking at today, uh, presumably uh, meant as a poison pill, I, I would oppose this amendment and urge my colleagues to do the same. Thank you. And now for what purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania, our ranking member, Seek recognition. Mr. Chairman, I, I rise to speak in favor and support of Mr. Rouser's amendment. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Chairman. I want to thank Mr. Rouser for offering this thoughtful amendment and voice my support for it. As I have said before, the forthcoming Packers and Stockyards or Gypsa rules we continue to hear so much about seem to have been plucked off the shelf by this administration, dusted off and rebranded as a silver bullet to every conceivable marketplace concern. These regulations are very controversial. The, they were very controversial the last time Secretary Vilsack attempted to push them through. I was here for that. And it seems the livestock and the meat industries remain very concerned about the breadth of these rules and their potential unintended consequences. If H.R. 7606 were enacted, the special investigator would be charged with enforcing these new rules and have the unfettered ability to test the legal limits of these new authorities. Now, I don't understand how even more regulations to be enforced by a new and duplicative office are somehow supposed to improve prices for producers and consumers. So at the very least, these proposals should undergo a thorough, updated economic analysis, factoring in current industry practices and market condition. And that is exactly what this amendment would require. And I think this is a very reasonable exercise in good governance and encourage my colleagues to support this amendment, and I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member. Is there anyone else who seeks recognition? Hearing no further discussion, the question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman, Mr. Rouser from North Carolina. Thank you. All those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed by saying no. 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 In opinion of the chair, the no's have it. Mr. Chairman, I, I ask for a roll call vote. Agreed. I ask for a roll call vote. A recorded vote has been requested. A recorded vote is so ordered. And further proceedings on this amendment will be postponed. Is there any further debate on amendments or the bill? Hearing none, we are now at the conclusion, and uh, the committee will stand in recess until 11 a.m. on tomorrow for recorded, for recorded votes, May 18th, so that we can all have plenty of time. They all will be Votes, Mr. Chairman, votes have not been called yet. We have two. Yeah, we only have two votes tomorrow. That conflicts with the gold ceremonies, gold medal ceremonies at 11 a.m. 
Ranking member, they've just called votes. We're trying well, to we get it arranged. <laughs> Hold on. What, yeah, let me get the see. latest data. All right, um, uh, let me just explain to everyone. We have members who are also voting on last votes in other committees. We want to make sure we arrange our votes when all of our members, certainly the majority, can be here. It's only fair to them. Believe me, I wish we could go ahead and vote now, but it wouldn't be right. There may be, yeah, ranking be. member, but allow me to please be considerate of every member. Yeah, now, <laughs> this committee stands in recess till 11 a.m. tomorrow when we all will have a convenient time to vote on these measures. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.